Hi, I'm Caitlin E and welcome to the Lit Review. Today we're going to talk about my most disappointing books of 2020. I'm going to try not to rant at you too hard. We'll see how that goes. I wanted to call this my most disappointing books of 2020 uh, because it feels wrong to me to call them the worst, even though there are maybe like one or two in this, this stack that I do think were my worst personal reads, if not of 2020, in some cases of all time. But in general, these are books that I just found disappointing for one reason or another. I know a lot of people say this when they do these videos, but I do think it needs to be said because reading is a very subjective experience. If these books that really disappointed me or made me upset are actually some of your favorites, you are still welcome here. That is 100% okay. We can have very different opinions on books. I am not coming for you and your reading tastes. I promise I'm not. Um, I'm going to try to keep that in mind as I, as I feel the rage overtake me with some of these titles. Uh, but you really truly are welcome here. It's okay if you, these are some of your favorites. I, I, I'm not attacking you, I promise. With that lovely caveat in mind, uh, let's get to the books. So I think I should probably start with the two books I DNF'd in 2020. I am not a very comfortable DNF'er. I wish I was able to say, I'm not interested in finishing this book more frequently. However, there were two books that made me actually hit that button pretty hard. First was um, a erotic romance by Katie Robert called Desperate Measures. This is the first book in her larger series about like basically Disney villains in a totally different context. Uh, and this was supposed to be the Jafar Jasmine book. I got about 50 to 60 pages into that little book and was like, mm, no, not what I was looking for. Thank you. Here, here's the best way I can think to put on this. Uh, within the realm of BDSM, I am not interested in humiliation. Humiliation does not do it for me. Um, as a kink, in in life outside of kink, um, it's not it's not something that I enjoy witnessing or participating in. So the fact that there was a lot of um, intent to humiliate or intent to abase, uh, which can be com perfectly fine between consenting adults if that is what you are interested in partaking in, uh, it, it doesn't work for me. So when I felt those kind of notes kicking in within Desperate Measures, mm mm. It was, it was just not for me. This is also sometimes why I struggle with things that are categorized as dark romances within the like indie self-published market, uh, because I think a lot of some of those narrative beats within those erotic romances rely on abasement or humiliation, and those are never going to work for me. So that was disappointing because I really love the jumping off point of like, the Disney villains having the heroine, and in some cases, I was really intrigued. I was hoping to get to like the Hades uh, and Megan Hercules one because that one just sounded really interesting. Uh, but I just I don't feel comfortable continuing on with the series based on what I know of from that first book. So disappointing. And then the other one I DNF'd, uh, if you remember, was from Lauren Rowe, and it was part of her um, her series involving this family of, of brothers, and I can't remember the name of the series, but. Uh, the individual book was called Ball Peen Hammer, uh, and the main character's name is Keen, and he is a stripper. He is a male entertainer, and he goes by the stage name of Ball Peen Hammer, so that's where the title comes from. So I had read another Lauren Rowe book prior to Ball Peen Hammer that uh, was in that series that I liked well enough. The The smut and the steamy scenes were were really top tier, uh, but it had some things that annoyed me. And I thought, and that book was called Captain, by the way, if I haven't mentioned that. Um, so I thought going into Ball Peen Hammer that I would be like, okay, I know certain things about this, this writing style or these characterizations like kind of get on my nerves a little bit. But knowing that, I thought I could like arm myself and just enjoy it for the good stuff that, that was clearly there in the other book. No. Um, I can't stand Keen. I don't care what growth he goes through. Uh, he's so immature and so, so dumb. I just don't have the attention span. I, I DNF'd that so hard. I am now hesitant to pick up another lore and row book, which is really unfortunate because I liked Captain um, and I 
that is how bad I thought Ball Peen Hammer was for like the 40 pages I got into it. So that was really disappointing because I was hoping to have found like a new contemporary author that I really liked within the romance genre, but uh, nope. Those were my two DNFs and those I think are clearly big disappointments for me because I don't, I will force myself to finish books that I am clearly not gonna love. The fact that I DNF something usually means like it is a hard no for me. So that is always disappointing when I've been pushed to that point. Now let's talk about some books I probably should have DNF'd but was too stubborn to stop. Uh, we gotta work on that. Uh, and by we, I mean me. This is not your problem. I'm just sharing mine with you. Uh, so you all, <laughs> if you watched uh, any of my historical romance reading <laughs> vlogs uh, from this past fall, you know that I read A Pirate's Love by Joanna Lindsay and was very unhappy with it. <laughs> For me, Joanna Lindsay is a bit of a hit or miss historical author. I read Hearts of Flame for the first historical romance readathon that I participated in in the spring of last year and really enjoyed it. Then I read this in the fall for the like round two of that. And this was, this was um, harrowing to read. There is so much sexual assault that it's, I, I don't know how you can call this a romance novel um, because it's mostly, it's mostly rape. Uh, and then somewhere along the line, she's like, oh, but I love him. I hate him, but I love him. And I hate that. That is not an acceptable trope. I do not understand how they fell in love. Um, no. Again, this is an author, like one bad experience with an author though. And we're talking like catastrophically bad can totally sour you on picking up other of their books. Like I actually have right here on my priority shelf, I have Fires of Winter by Joanna Lindsay, um, which is the first book. This is like the, the prequel to Hearts of Flame, um, which I picked up because of my positive experience. Uh, and I have been avoiding this book because of this book. So eh, this is this is gonna be a recurring theme throughout this disappointing reads video because now I have built up mental warnings or like mental red flags when I see some of these authors' names and it's making me hesitate to pick them up again, which is by the way, is totally valid. Um, I am just concerned because in some cases these were authors that I was a big fan of before. Uh, not so much with Joanna Lindsay. I was just kind of exploring and dipping my toe in the waters of her, of her very large amount of publications. Um, so I think I will still read this, but like this was such a disappointment that I am now scared to read this. <sighs> we're gonna, we're gonna bring the energy down a little bit by talking about a book that was only mildly disappointing. Spoiler, this is the only book in this list today that I'm actually keeping. I think. Um, and this got a three star from me. So it was like disappointing for other reasons. I still liked it. Um, but that would be Bloodlust and Bonnets by Emily McGovern. So this is the like first published graphic novel uh, from Emily McGovern, who I know on Instagram and other creative spaces as being the uh, comic author between uh, My Life as a Background Slytherin, which I very much love. If she ever puts out a collection of that, I will still buy that. She has not burned all of her goodwill. I will still be buying her stuff. This is also why I'm going to be keeping that book because I still really do love her general sense of comedy. Um, the plot, I feel like this was honestly just too long. Like it, at a certain point I was like, okay, I think you're, you're just maybe better in short form comics, which is totally fine. Like people have built entire careers off of that. And I think her comedy, which I deeply appreciate in her, in her web comics, um, doesn't do as well in this long continuous format because I think her comedy does really well when there's like gaps and you let it breathe and you let like, if, if you if you let it have like the ba -dum -ba -dum -tsh moment and then you like end the comic panel and then come back for something new, you know, like there's, I think her, her comedy works better when there's there's space. And when you have a continuous narrative, you, the reader, have to create that space by walking away. Um, whereas me as a reader, when I'm reading a graphic novel, like just wants to finish it. So it kind of was at odds in that way. And that's what led to my disappointment. Um, but I still am going to keep this and continue to support Emily McGovern.
it takes a lot out of you ranting uh then i'm i'm gonna maybe break some hearts here because i know this was a fairly beloved book uh in 2020 it's also one of the most beautiful books i've ever seen and that's the owl crate version of the kingdom of back by marie lou so i i still think this is again one of the most gorgeous books i've ever owned like this cover is is stunning you know i love a, a gilded page <sighs> I was not entranced by this narrative. I wanted to be because it is a book about Mozart's older sister who is equally a prodigy in composition and and she finds herself being continually overshadowed by her younger brother and this leads to a lot of complicated feelings for her and through those complicated feelings uh, she and her brother are able to escape to this this fictional kingdom this magical fictional kingdom called the kingdom of back and it's one that they initially make up for each other in stories uh, but it kind of comes to life and takes on a life of its own uh, that Nanarol, the main character has to uh, like kind of navigate and push against uh, in order to make sure that her reality is left mostly unaffected by the the dangers of the kingdom of back i wanted to really like this because i think it is actually getting to the points of like equality and looking back at history with a lens of making space for the women in it <laughs> um and and knowing the depth of their involvement when history has mostly written over them um and i love that kind of narrative I am not convinced I am a magical realism reader after reading this book. Um, I think that might be a bit of a personal hurdle for me because there are, I would definitely classify this as having like not so much fantasy, but magical realism. Um, so that, that was a bit of a stumbling block for me that I did not anticipate. Uh, I still, again, this was, this is still in my maybe box uh, from my, my wrap ups where I decide whether or not I'm keeping something. Um, so it's still a maybe for me. I haven't decided whether or not I'm going to keep it. Literally, when I look at this, though, the thing that makes me want to keep it on my shelves is that it's beautiful. It is It is some of the most stunning piece of art in book form that I've ever, I've ever seen with my own eyes. Uh, it, just the cover, the intricacy of this cover is is so beautiful. I, I, but that's what I, that's why I would keep it. Like that doesn't feel right. So I don't know. I'm just disappointed that I didn't love it as much as I love the aesthetics. Um, and, and that's always a big letdown. I, I know that you don't read books purely for their covers, but I do really care about graphic design and cover design. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just disappointed. Whew. All right. Um, next, this is a book that I definitely picked up on recommendation from another, another booktuber I admire, uh, Emma from Drinking by My Shelf. And she hadn't even read it, but because she picked it up and had liked other books by this author, I was like, oh, okay, I'll give it a try. Uh, and this was a big disappointment, even more disappointing when she ended up actually reading it and loving it. Uh, but that is Frog Music by Emma Donahue. This was also difficult because it takes place in like the late 1800s, like 18, 1876. Uh, and it takes place during a pandemic, uh, which was difficult to read kind of early, in the early days of the pandemic when my claustrophobia was at probably its peak. Uh, for for the current pandemic that we have all been living through. Uh, I also just didn't really connect with Blanche as a main character. Like, I wanted to. I think there are moments where I had compassion for Blanche, but I just, at the end of the day, did not connect with her. I thought uh, the use of Jenny Bonnet's character, which was kind of the jumping off point for the story, was the the murder of Jenny Bonnet, who in the history books is known for like wearing pants and being kind of a controversial gender bending figure. And in some historical accounts, um, not Emma Donahue's book, in some historical accounts, Jenny Bonnet is kind of identified as maybe a potential trans woman. Um, but that is not how Emma Donahue identifies her. She does not like bluntly state uh, Jenny's identity in that way. I was kind of going into this hoping for some of that representation. I didn't get it. Um, 
and I felt like what ended up happening with her character felt more exploitative, um, maybe because of those expectations that I had put on this, knowing what little bit of history that I did. Sometimes this sort of thing happens where my expectations clash with the reality of the book, which is really about my issues and not necessarily like an inherent problem with the book because I'm the one who built those expectations, uh, but they still affect my reading experience. So this was really disappointing. I am not keeping this. This is getting unhauled. The next time I do an unhaul, it is in my no box for sure. Uh, and I believe I read these very close together, some of these next picks, uh, but this was also a huge disappointment. It was such a disappointment that I not only got rid of this book, or will be getting rid of this book, but I also put the other two books I own by this author in my no box because I didn't want to read any more from her. Uh, and that is Assassination Vacation by Sarah Val. So let's talk context for a bit. I went to college for creative writing and literature. That is what my bachelor's degree is in. And throughout that college experience, I took a lot of different classes, one of which uh, was creative nonfiction meaning that like the core of what you're trying to tell is a true story, is a nonfiction story, but you maybe take some creative liber liberties along the way. You either write yourself into the narrative by making it part memoir, part historical thing. Like there's a lot of different ways that you can speak to creative nonfiction. The one example that I just gave is kind of what Sarah Val is doing by telling you uh, a lot of researched historical things, but also very much describing her experience of that research and her experience of tracking down these different monuments and spaces. So Assassination Vacation was actually something that I had to read like an excerpt of in college, which granted was many, many moons ago. Uh, but I was always really intrigued and ended up buying several of her books on places like Book Outlet or at used bookstores over the years because I just wanted to read more of that really cool thing that I read in a college class. But then I never got around to it and they just kind of sat on my shelves and 2020 was the year that I decided to tackle them. Uh, I probably should have just stuck to reading them in college um, and maybe I would have rosier memories because right now what I'm struggling with with this particular book and what made me decide to get rid of her other books is the humor. Uh, so this particular book is written in 2005 and there's a lot of humor that I think is very rooted in a cultural moment in the early 2000s that I think broadly we've moved beyond and so now that humor reads as very um, out of touch. There's also a lot of her very aggressive political opinions uh, that I don't necessarily align with nor disagree with but it was just enough of that tension to make me uncomfortable. And it really, they were really small moments, but they completely threw me out of the experience and made me go, do I wanna continue with this? So while I think this is a really well-researched book and has a lot of cool historical moments, she also, this book in particular, Assassination Vacation, is supposed to be talking you through like significant moments and places in history that have led to either assassination attempts or successful ones. Uh, and we, <laughs> You don't really talk about, um, I think it's JFK that she almost completely ignores in this book. Uh, and so you only get like a couple of, of the presidents who have had assassination attempts. It just didn't feel entirely what I would have like wanted or hoped for. Again, expectations meeting reality. Uh, okay. Another, another one that just like really, really disappointed me. And I have to give you the context on this is, uh, Galen Foley's Duke of Scandal. So this is a really tiny book. Again, I believe I read this for one of the historical romance readathons. Uh, and it just really bothered me, um, in large part because I have, uh, when I was a teenager, I read a lot of Galen Foley. Uh, and in particular, I have really positive memories of how she handled, uh, PTSD, even though that is not a term that her characters would ever have used, but that is what her characters are dealing with. So in one of her earlier series, uh, her Night Miscellany series, I believe, uh, there is a character who comes back from the Napoleonic Wars, I believe, uh, and really has to deal with some very intense markers of PTSD. And so that is part of his narrative journey, part of his even romance with his eventual partner, uh, is dealing and coping with the realities of his PTSD, doing things like he can't hit, there's a fire, there's fireworks at a celebration, and it like really sets him off and like puts him in a corner because he's so, he's so put back in his moment. And I really thought like, wow, this is 
a really interesting conversation about mental health, particularly of male soldiers in a historical romance. And I remember thinking that that was really cool, uh, that that was a discussion that she was willing to have for her characters. It was, it felt like especially unique at the time. Now cut to Duke of Scandal. Uh, and this does not handle mental health very well at all, in my opinion, uh, both for the male character and the female character and for the one of the sub characters who clearly also is showing markers of PTSD. Um, but instead of handling it with any type of grace, it's handled very poorly and often in jest or uh, with a lot of sarcasm by the male lead who is allegedly this this person's friend. Um, and so it was rough to read. I also did not care for their romance. While there were some nice steamy scenes uh, when they actually got together, there are also some really uh, tough to read scenes where like the male main character is contemplating suicide or joking to other people about suicide. And then it's just, it's really hard because we end up getting a narrative where the female character is like saving him from that feeling. And that just, that didn't, that didn't sit right with me. Like it didn't feel like good representation, um, or healthy representation for, for, for suicidal thoughts. <laughs> um, and so that just made me deeply uncomfortable and deeply unhappy. And so I was so disappointed, not just in this book, but in Galen fully, because I'm, I now almost like want to go back and try to read that book that I thought had good representation. Is it just that I've grown to realize what better representation is, or did she like pivot and, and do something really different with her writing style that just didn't gel with me? I don't, I don't know. Um, so this one hurt. This one actually bothered me because I really felt like I was going into this feeling good about this author. And so again, this is another thing where I'm not just leaving this book as a disappointment. I'm leaving this book questioning whether I should ever pick up more of the author's work. And this used to be kind of a treasured historical romance author for me. So that is hugely disappointing. <sighs> oh my gosh, I've brought my mood down so much by making this video. Uh, so my last book, my last disappointing read of 2020 um, is one that I got in an owl crate and I've heard like a little bit of hype. I still hear people um, love up on this book. So again, if this is one of your favorites, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, and to, to be clear, this one didn't offend or hurt me like some of the others in this stack. So hopefully I'm not going to hurt or offend you in the process. Uh, but one of my most disappointing reads of 2020 was undoubtedly Winterwood by Shay Earnshaw. So again, I'll create exclusive, beautiful, let's tilt it this way so you can actually see it and not get blinded by foil. Beautiful blue sprayed edges, really beautiful cover. Um, that's kind of where my interest ends with this book. So our main character is Nora Walker and the Walker women are, have long been reputed to be witches. And one day, uh, so there's this big mysterious kind of creepy forest called the Winterwood that only the Walker women can safely traverse. And so, uh, Nora sometimes goes in and finds a bunch of like lost things. One day she finds a young boy and is trying to figure out how he got lost in the forest. Um, and he seems to have come from like a boys camp across the way. Here's what I found. I didn't ask you. Oh my God. Siri was like 15 haunted forests around the world. No, thank you. Oh my God. Oh, please don't do that again. That's kind of her journey. And there were some parts of this that I really liked, like learning about, uh, the snippets of former Walker women and like what their gifts entailed was really cool. Uh, and there are two big like twists in this book, uh, that I will say nothing about because they are very spoilery, obviously, because they're the two big twists. I will tell you that within the first less than 50 pages, probably closer to 20 pages, I knew what both of those twists were. And that was really dissatisfying. I'm okay with guessing a twist. If you make me work for it, you know, um, 20, 20 to 30 pages is not making me work for it. It is a short book, but no, I knew what both of the twists were going to be very quickly. And that was hugely disappointing to me. Um, I think Shay Earnshaw's writing is very atmospheric and interesting. If I read any more of her work, it will be through the library, but I am not convinced that I want to read more of her work because I felt like her 
narrative writing style, though atmospheric and eerie and beautiful, was also very transparent. And I didn't feel like there was any surprise or suspense for me as a reader. Not to hate on anybody who loves this or who could love this, uh, but for who I am as a reader, this was just not it. <sighs> okay, so those are my most disappointing books from 2020. Thankfully, there were not too many, uh, but there were there were a few, and they were, uh, as you can tell by my ranting, they were mighty disappointing. Uh, so again, I don't want to call these the worst, although some of them probably deserve that title, looking at you, a pirate's love. Um, but yeah, these, these were not my faves. Sorry if they are yours, though. I, I don't want to hurt you. Also, I just want to share that in the month of January, which is my birth month, I am going to be opening up my Amazon wish list per the request of some of you lovely folks. So there is no pressure whatsoever, but if you would like to support me and this channel a little bit, uh, my Amazon wish list will be open for the month of January, uh, and then I will close it again until I can next do a book haul. So there's that. Do with it what you will, but no pressure. Ending this on a very positive note, because thank you for spending the time with me, not just today, but any day that you watch my videos. I hope you're having a fantastic reading day. Like and subscribe if you'd like to see more of me or this channel, and I'll see you in the next one.